I'm so excited to sit down with you today. Well, thanks, Elisa. Me too. Yeah, so I want to make sure I get the name of your company right. Your consulting company is Davidius Partners, correct? That's correct. Okay, cool. So how long have you been doing that? Um, since 2016. Okay. So that's what, two, a little bit more than two years when I left my last job, I decided to go back on my own. Oh, cool. And that was when you were with, was it Backcountry that you Yeah, it was from? Backcountry. So I was the EVP of people at Backcountry prior to that. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Well, in looking at your history, I know that you've worked with large companies, you've worked with some mid-sized, some small. Mm -hmm. Help me understand some of the differences between, from your perspective, What's different in organizations of those different sizes? Yeah, well, I have. I've worked in, you know, the largest place that I ever worked was United Airlines, and that was 85,000 people. Um, and the smallest place I ever worked in my professional career has been at Backcountry, which was about 1,200. A um, lot of differences. I think, you know, for me, the most, um, probably the most noticeable difference is the intimacy of the work environment. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, in United, at 85,000 people, I was working in the Willis Tower in Chicago on the, you know, the 42nd floor, and it was just a big, big company with literally thousands of people milling about doing all kinds of different things. Backcountry, on the other hand, you know, we were all working um, at the corporate headquarters in Park City. There were 275 to 300 people in that office, and you literally knew everybody by name. So I think that's thing number one. Um, thing number two, for sure, is the ability to move quickly. Um, larger organizations have a tremendous amount of inertia, and um, it just takes more cycles to get things done. There's more internal selling that has to happen. There's more competition for resources in a big company. Um, and there, you run into more of the, this is the way we do it here kind of mindset. Whereas in a small company, you're nimble, um, you really can round people up quickly and sit down and have a conversation and say, how about we do this? And if you can get people on board, you can go make things happen quick. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, that's the second thing. And then maybe the third thing is access to resources to deploy to get things done. So, a little bit of a dichotomy between working in a small company where you can be more nimble. But in general, you don't have as much financial and people resources to deploy as you do in a big company. So I'd say those those are the three things that really stand out for me. Okay, well deeper dive on that. So mm -hmm. your Disrupt HR talk was specific about how those HR metrics that we all spend so much time mm -hmm. on and are putting these nice little pretty reports together for are really not that impactful and not really what the C-suite is wanting to focus on. So help me understand how that relates to these different, <coughs> uh, the different sizes of organizations mm -hmm. as well from you know large, did you notice a difference from the C-suite in terms of data and metrics, or do you feel like that's just kind of across the board? Um, I, I think it's, it is a macro trend for sure, um, but I think that trend is, is probably felt more acutely when you're in a smaller environment, because again, you're looking at trying to make an impact, but because you don't have um, the, the sheer volume of people and dollars to throw at problems, um, you've got to be much more careful about how you invest your limited resources and to demonstrate a return on those. And that's a big thing for me is, you know, everything that I did at Backcountry, I felt, and I think the executive team would agree, was really focused on, you know, contributing to the overall success of the business model. So it was very easy to draw, well not easy, but it was important to draw a line between a business result that, say, our private equity owners wanted to see um, and the work that we did in the people function. Uh, whereas at United, you know, we had things like a good okay. example of that was, you know, I was in charge of corporate training at United. Um, we spent a lot of time working on, um, spent a lot of time working on uh, customer training because, you know, United had, you've seen the video, people getting dragged through the aisles of airplanes. Yeah. That's an anomaly, but we still had a lot of issues with uh, customer service post merger. So throwing a lot of people and resources at customer service um, didn't have as long, as quick a payback because you just have that inertia that you run into of getting the, you know, whether it's the flight attendants or the baggage handlers or whomever to really understand what we're trying to accomplish from a change point of view. Yeah. So I think those are, you know, as I say, it's, it's definitely a trend um, in my mind across all HR functions. But I think in a smaller business, you know, again, being able to move more quickly and being able to uh, 
to demonstrate results faster lead you down the path of being more business oriented in your metrics and less what I like to think of as traditional HR metrics that are activity oriented as opposed to business oriented. Sure. So, okay, that's a, another good question along that same vein of thought. When it comes to how you can influence culture mm -hmm. in these different sides of organizations, um, as you said, you know, being nimble and being in a small environment, it's a lot easier mm -hmm. to steer that ship than it is, you know, the great big cruise ship right. that's, uh, <laughs> that's yeah, going to take exactly. about 10 minutes to even mm -hmm. get uh, going that direction. So how, how have you been able to influence in some of these companies either a culture change or a culture shift or as you're trying to develop a new standard with those organizations? Like how right. do you do that in a company that's so large? So I, I think um, this is a place where the at least the approach to me is the same whether you're in a big company or in a small company. It's just a matter of speed um, and getting it done. But I'm a big believer that culture is defined by people's behavior. Um, and you know, it's, it's really a very simple question. How do we do things around here? And culture is the answer to how do we do things around here? Um, I think what you find very often in companies is that culture evolves organically. And it's not always the first thing that's on the top of a business founder's mind when he or she gets something off the ground. But as companies grow and scale and start to acquire more employees, people start watching how things get done. And so it's really an example that's set by the leadership of a company in terms of their ability to be effective role models. So if you buy that argument, if you buy that culture is defined by behavior, I'm a big believer in understanding what your values are and how your values influence behavior. Mm -hmm. And I've found it to be very successful to be, frankly, very prescriptive in how you define behavior and what is and what is not accepted in a particular company. Um, because ultimately, it's the behavior that defines culture. So if you see a bad example, you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of press recently about sexual harassment in companies. That doesn't just happen overnight. That's a problem that grows. And if it doesn't get dealt with um, in a very strong and forceful manner, it will continue to happen. So there's a good example of you know, culture that goes awry, and pretty soon you find yourself in a situation where you're dealing with a great big problem. So what do you do? In my mind, defining behaviors as they evolve from the company values is the first step. And then for people like us who are HR leaders, it's a matter of saying, okay, if this is the set of behaviors that we expect people to engage in, how are we gonna re reinforce those? How are we gonna prescribe them for people so they understand? Um, so I tend to take a very behavioral model on culture, and then things like performance management, hiring, compensation, all of those things should lend themselves towards reinforcing the behaviors that you want. Because if you get the behaviors right, and they flow from the values that you ascribe to, then you've really got a nice culture model. Yeah, makes the, sense. Yeah, so the difference is, you know, in a small company, you can, um, if you see something that is countercultural, so to speak, you can put your finger on it really quick uh, and fix it. Um, whereas in a big company, if you're dealing with thousands of people, you're trying to influence the behavior of thousands of people, it just makes sense that it takes longer to do it. But I think the, the basic solution uh, values lead to behaviors, behaviors are what create culture, works no matter where you are. Yeah. Okay. So you are a seasoned HR professional. I have That's... a lot of gray hair, thank you. That's very tactful, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm in the twilight of my career, Elisa. Thank you, you know for what, that. though, blonde and silver, we're practically the same. Yeah. So um, what I wanted to ask is, being in this industry and specifically in this profession for as long as you have, mm -hmm. What is one of the most surprising changes that you've seen that have come out of this profession that uh, has just sort of shocked you and something that's that's just kind of yeah. everyday now? I mean, I think, you know, in, in our profession, in, in the, the world of people, um, I think the recognition that culture and people are important has grown significantly over the last, let's say, the last 30 years or so. Um, I think more CEOs are talking about you know, culture. I think more people are being hired to prescribe culture. And the recognition is that while companies can compete for talent, 
in terms of how you know how they pay, how they compensate, what the work-life balance might be if there is such a thing. There are a lot of a lot of ways that companies can define themselves as a unique place to work. But really, what keeps people coming back these days is: Do I like the people that I work with? Do I feel like I'm working in a healthy culture? So I think that's a big trend, and and as a result, I think we're seeing more and more opportunity for people in the HR profession to really make a contribution that makes a difference for the business because of that emphasis. Um, I've also seen over the years, and this has been written about, you know, kind of a. a a divergence of table stakes HR, which is compensation and benefits and, you know, compliance and employer relations. Those are the things that I consider to be tactical and strategic HR, which is more about, you know, how you create a culture, the people that you hire, the work environment that you want to um, foster, the growth opportunities, your retention strategies, all of those things tend to be more strategic. So I think you're seeing that happen more and more. And the other thing that goes hand in hand with that is that because the tactical stuff, which is necessary, but it's not sufficient for making a company successful, can be outsourced. You're seeing more and more people who have a real passion for the, the what I consider the strategic talent oriented side of HR, moving into that practice. And those people are not necessarily coming out of HR backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Which I think is exciting. In fact, you know, I, I make an argument in the talk that I did for Disrupt HR that um, young folks who are building a career in HR right now would be much better served not to be known as HR people, but to be known as business people instead. Oh, I love it. Well, this has been fantastic. Thanks for the deeper dive on your content. Sure. And we're excited to keep you partnered with our brand and hope you'll join us at the next event. I would love to. I'll be there with bells on. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ted.